All righty. Uh, thanks, Chris, uh, for that introduction. And thanks, everybody, for coming. I know it's the last talk of the last session, so I really appreciate that. Um, I'm really excited to present uh, my work, Fish Farm, uh, which will be measuring the effectiveness of evasion techniques against modern anti-fishing blacklists. And this is joint work with my colleagues at Arizona State University, as well as PayPal. So we all know that phishing attacks rely on social engineering to get users to submit credentials or other sensitive information onto malicious websites after following malicious messages. And on the surface, these attacks seem a little bit trivial, but they work and they cause widespread damage because we have a extensive ecosystem which supports these attacks and makes them scalable. And for that reason, uh, these phishing attacks are a challenge to mitigate at scale. Here's one example of a uh, recent phishing attack which actually compromised the email inbox of uh, John Podesta, one of the Democratic uh, Party uh, leaders. And this email bypassed both technical and human review. So it bypassed the uh, spam filters and the blacklists and also bypassed people who looked at this email and said, you know, this looks legit. You should probably follow the link. Now, phishing has been around for a while. This isn't the first uh, you know, kind of issue that we've run into. So we have uh, a key defense, which is browser blacklists. And these are deployed across major uh, web browsers, both on desktop and mobile. And the idea is that when you visit a malicious website, you'll see a prominent warning, such as this one, which will effectively prevent you from accessing the content unless you try really hard. So the objectives of blacklists are twofold. First of all, we want timely and comprehensive uh, detection and blocking of malicious websites. And we also want a low false positive rate so that websites, don't, websites that have legitimate business don't get disrupted. Of course, it is in the interest of attackers to circumvent these uh, blacklists. And the way they do this is by various evasion techniques. Before I get into those evasion techniques, here's a quick glance at the anti-phishing blacklists as they, um, as they were when we did this research. So Google Safe Browsing protects Chrome, Firefox, and Safari, and they have a significant uh, majority of the market share, both on desktop and mobile. Uh, Microsoft Screen will protect uh, Windows, uh, Internet Explorer, and Edge, and then the Opera blacklist protects the Opera browser. There are still some browsers that don't have any of this protection, uh, such as Android browser, but that gap is narrowing. So why do we want these evasion techniques uh, for attackers? So blacklists work as follows. First, a malicious URL will be reported to the anti-phishing entity that controls the blacklist. That URL will then be checked by the entity, classified as a phishing URL, and added to the blacklist. So for example, as you can see here, the website secure-login-paypal.com should show up with a red warning. But if we employ evasion techniques such as cloaking, the victim will visit the site and they will see the content, uh, which is the bogus login page. But when the security uh, crawler visits the page, they might get either benign content or an error message saying that there's nothing there. And when this happens, it's possible that the URL will never be added to the blacklist. And as a result, the attack will stay on for a longer amount of time before it's mitigated, and attackers get a better return on investment. So our key research question is, how effective are these cloaking techniques really against our blacklists? Our prior work has not actually looked at this. So when we employ cloaking, does the blacklisting occur? Are all the browsers, all the users, and all the devices consistently protected? And is the blacklisting quick enough uh, to prevent real-world harm? In order to uh, figure this out, we started by deploying some preliminary experiments to really understand how these anti-phishing entities behave. We wanted to deploy a controlled configuration that's representative of the real anti-phishing ecosystem and real phishing websites. And we wanted to use this information obtained through the preliminary experiments to guide the full-scale experiments that follow to give us a statistically significant sample. Another advantage of this approach is that whatever security recommendations we find uh, early on could be shared with the anti-phishing entities. And our goal was to evaluate cloaking techniques that target real-world parts of the population. So we wanted to pick techniques that are representative of real users out there. 
So in addition to having some websites that have no cloaking as our control group, we started by having a technique that targets specifically mobile users, so Android and iOS. We believe that this is a very large subset of users today. We also looked at geolocation, so US and non-US desktop users kind of killing two birds with one stone with these cloaking techniques. We also took a real-world collection of IP addresses, user agents, and host names from a large data set of real uh, phishing sites. So kind of to understand, do off-the-shelf phishing kits really work? And is there any purpose to these filtering techniques that they employ on the back end? Finally, JavaScript uh, is what we believe to be an emerging uh, cloaking technique. So we included a batch of websites that has phishing content that only renders if JavaScript is running in the browser. So for our preliminary experiments, we take these six cloaking techniques and we create batches of websites with six or seven of each. We then take each batch and report it to 10 top anti-phishing entities for a total of 400 sites. We then used both random and deceptive URLs to understand if the URL plays an important factor alongside the entity and the cloaking technique. And the way we did this was as follows. We started by configuring and deploying the websites in cloud infrastructure using Fish Farm. This is according to our experimental design. We then reported each batch to the anti-phishing entities directly. So for example, there'd be one batch of sites only going to Google, there'd be one batch of sites only going to Microsoft, and so on. We then have a monitoring system which is continuously looking through the various web browsers that we're targeting, both on desktop and mobile, to see whether or not the blacklisting is actually occurring. And all of this can be done with a minimal setup and essentially end-to-end -end automation. Uh, I'm not going to go in depth on the technical implementation, uh, but if you're interested, please take a look at the paper where we document that. Here's an example of one of our phishing websites. Uh, because this project was in collabor uh, collaboration with PayPal, we, of course, had permission to use their logo and their look and feel. Uh, and on an ethical note, we did not actually collect any credentials, nor was there a capacity to collect credentials, uh, though from the, the perspective of a web crawler, it would appear as if we had that capacity. We also never distributed these websites to any real users. We only sent them directly to the anti-abuse entities. And when monitoring, in the ideal case, we wanted to see this kind of warning very early on. So this was kind of the thing that we wanted to see. After we ran the preliminary experiments, we had a number of security recommendations that I'll get into later. Uh, we started by having disclosure meetings with the top browser vendors and anti-phishing entities. Uh, we also put together a written report to other organizations which were involved in the study, but either we couldn't reach or that were not uh, directly uh, part of the disclosure. So we then moved on to the full experiments. And the, pre uh, the preliminary experiments gave us good data and a good indication that these six cloaking techniques were, in fact, um, good choices. So we wanted to scale up everything. We went from six from the preliminary experiments up to 66 of each of these for a total batch size of about 400 sites per entity. And again, as before, we reported each batch to each entity for a total of almost 2,000 sites. Lastly, for the full experiments, we took out the URL variations, and all the URLs were random, just to eliminate that as a confounding factor. Here's a quick video. This is not in the paper. I just wanted to show how this all works. So we have our experimental configuration, and this gets imported into Fish Farm. Now all those websites, those 2,000 websites, have been deployed in our uh, cloud infrastructure. We go ahead and activate the websites so that now they can be publicly accessible. And once they're activated, uh, we'll get a confirmation of this. And we can go ahead and proceed to report the websites to the entity. And this is as easy as uh, just selecting them all. Our framework will send out the emails. Those emails will contain essentially a phishing message, similar to what a real user might see and similar to what a spam filter uh, might be trained on. Here's an example of uh, a live uh, example of one of our websites. It will look very similar to what we saw in that screenshot earlier. And as I mentioned, we had a total of uh, over 2,000 of these. Finally, while these sites, uh, after these sites have been reported, we're running this monitoring system in the back end that's looking through uh, all the browsers and checking for these uh, blacklist warning messages. We ran this for about 72 hours. 
And after this, we had a treasure trove of data which we could then analyze to understand the ecosystem. Uh, at the end of the deployment, we had over 20,000 blacklist timestamps from all of these sites, and we also got over two million web hits from the crawling infrastructure. So there was a very large volume of activity uh, from the security crawlers. Uh, in our experiment, we saw that cloaking uh, reduced the likelihood of blacklisting uh, by about half, and it doubled the time of blacklisting. Uh, in addition, sites that had cloaking techniques were less likely to actually be visited. Now, I'll throw in one caveat here. Um, this is assuming that a reporting methodology is representative of the ecosystem. So these results do not generalize necessarily to the entire population, but they're representative of our experimental design, which can uh, always be modified uh, as needed you know, using this framework. So now I'd like to talk about the specific effectiveness of each individual cloaking technique. This chart combines the results across all of the browsers, and on the y-axis, we're looking at the total percentage of websites that are being blacklisted. Now, this percentage might seem a little bit low, and this is because some anti-phishing entities, such as Google, aren't protecting browsers such as Internet Explorer and Edge, even though uh, we were monitoring those browsers. On the y-axis, we have the number of hours that have elapsed since we sent those reports and since the phishing sites went live. And on the far right uh, are the last three days of the experiment, just for space so that you can see what's going on. We observed that the real ch uh, change in blacklisting happens after about two hours or so. So before then, a very small percentage of sites is blacklisted, but uh, after about two hours, we see some significant growth. And websites without any cloaking techniques were the most likely to be blacklisted there. We see a similar story after eight hours, where websites that had, uh, for example, the US only geo filter were the least likely to be blacklisted, with all the other filters uh, falling somewhere in between on that range. Uh, you'll notice at the end, uh, there's some of the, uh, this is the HD access data set. Those are actually more likely to be blacklisted than the uh, sites without cloaking. And this is because uh, I believe that there's some finger fingerprinting going on of these real world phishing sites. Now one last thing that might not have been immediately obvious is the bottom of the chart. You'll notice that the iOS and Android uh, cloaking techniques saw absolutely no blacklisting. So this means that sites that were targeted at mobile users were never mitigated using this, uh, you know, these blacklists. And moreover, the sites that were blacklisted on desktop platforms would also not show any warnings on mobile. So this is a huge finding that we made uh, you know, after deploying this. One of our biggest anti-phishing defenses was actually not working in mobile devices at all. We saw that US-only uh, cloaking websites were not blacklisted by Google Safe Browsing. Uh, and we believe this is because of the, the way the infrastructure worked on the back end. Similarly, for other anti-phishing entities, the non-US sites uh, were not being blacklisted. The real-world cloaking uh, from those phishing kits were effective in the first 12 hours. And the JavaScript cloaking slowed blacklisting in the long term quite effectively. So looking at the browsers individually, the three browsers protected by Google Safe Browsing, they dominate the market. And luckily, Google Safe Browsing was the fastest blacklist. This is a very good finding. But those gaps, as I mentioned, with mobile, they have the largest impact at that point. So the fact that there was no blacklisting in Android and iOS meant that a significant number of users were not being protected. Uh, Microsoft Smart Screen is actually the only blacklist that used uh, proactive heuristics on the page content and the URL to blacklist websites without actually verifying the content. So this is a, a, a good thing. Uh, but unfortunately, fishers are shifting away from using deceptive URLs and using other techniques that bypass these heuristics. In our experiment, we saw very limited coverage from Opera. And we saw very limited data sharing between uh, Google and Microsoft's blacklists, although clearing houses such as the APWG did share data. So a key outcome of this research is that following our disclosure to Google, um, we are actually able to address this mobile blacklisting issue. Uh, before September 2018, if you visited a known malicious site, uh, a known phishing site, you would see uh, something like this. You'd see the real login page. Uh, but now you should be seeing the warning correctly. Uh, and in addition, other cloaking techniques that we've looked at are now more easily detectable. So uh, looking at the broader ecosystem, what are some of the vulnerabilities that are still out there? 
Uh, so we believe that cloaking uh, still prolongs the window of opportunity uh, that fishers have. And in particular, the geospecific cloaking, uh, not even limited to the US, but if it's limited to specific countries, uh, is a legitimate concern uh, for the anti-fishing ecosystem today. Our mitigations are not fast enough to prevent uh, abuse, and both blacklist and hosting infrastructure um, are, are areas that could be improved. Finally, there's a need for continuous testing and verification of our defenses, uh, which is something that Fish Farm supp uh, supports, and it's a way for detecting that baseline mitigations, such as the desktop and mobile, uh, are both uh, working as intended. We can also proactively test any emerging techniques for evasion uh, that might come out. Uh, I expect novel cloaking techniques, especially those based on JavaScript, to be developed over time, and this is something that we should expect. Uh, finally, data sharing between entities, I think, is an important thing, an important change that we can do uh, to improve the effectiveness of next generation anti-phishing systems. Trusted reporting channels between victims of phishing and the organizations that are being phished and the blacklist providers themselves uh, would offer intelligence that might not immediately be available to blacklist providers. And finally, in the long term, proactive detection techniques that involve uh, these trusted reporting channels and other intelligence beyond just content uh, is something that we should look to. Of course, a multi-layer strategy is the most effective, so this should all be done alongside other mitigations such as two-factor authentication, user training, and so forth. Uh, so with that, um, that's everything I have, and I'll be happy to take any questions. Thank you. Thanks so much. We have plenty of time for questions. So I definitely have uh, a couple questions. So one of the big ones, I think you did mention a little bit about ecological validity. I think that, um, so just to confirm, you sent the URL for your page once to the reporting, and there was no other ingestion of that URL into their system. That's correct. In these experiments, we did it once, yes. Okay. That's something we decided to do just because we did not know what would happen, so we had to make these controls in these experiments. Uh, but I think that going forward, uh, it might be more representative to either continuously send these sorts of reports or uh, vary the distribution channels and include multiple entities in a single deployment. Hello, uh, my name is Christina Graovanu from Microsoft, and uh, phishing is one of the things that I do there, um, detection for advanced threat protection part of uh, Office Exchange. Um, I can tell you that submission channels are different depending on the um, part that you submit to. So if you would submit something which is goes to a Hotmail account versus a, an exchange advanced threat protection account, the results are different because um, analyzing the content of the page is quite expensive at scale. So it's something to keep in mind uh, as you're doing the analysis. Uh, right, yeah, we, uh, we're very aware of this and also the fact that there are many uh, non-public submission channels um, if you want to take this offline, um, I'd be happy there's to. some other ways we could talk about. Thank you. Yeah, I think along those lines, when you did contact these uh, anti-phishing providers, did any of them give you some sort of insight into, oh, this submission channel is going to be completely different than what we're getting through our Hotmail or what we're getting through our Gmail? So when we reached out to the entities in the preliminary disclosure, they seemed fine with our approach. Uh, they didn't really make any uh, comments to that effect. Maybe the conference. Oh, there we go. All right. <laughs> Maybe they thought we were done. Uh, Luke does tell Samsung Research America. Um, the ease at which you seem to be able to generate these phishing sites it is, is scary to me. Um, even if they get shut down very quickly, like within a, a 24 hours or just a few hours, does it really matter from the attacker's perspective if they can automatically make more and more at new domains? Uh, it doesn't matter, actually. And this is why phishing attacks are so scalable these days. Uh, you know, We see hundreds of sites being deployed uh, per hour. Um, so that's why our defenses just need to be, uh, we can't have that gap. It needs to be proactive. Yeah. Um, and this is also the reason why we're not open sourcing. Even though we're open to sharing the framework with researchers, we're not you know, going to distribute this to uh, malicious users. 
And one more thing I'd like to add to that is, um, I don't think I mentioned it in the talk, but abuse reports coming into the hosting providers that we used um, took about 17 hours uh, on average uh, from the time that the phishing site was deployed. Uh, and in addition, it was very easy to just tell the hosting provider not to worry about it, and they didn't actually uh, action um, anything for uh, several months before actually reaching out to us and verifying that, hey, we're legitimate researchers and not actual criminals. I had one more question. So did you see any sort of quantization in when your site would get blacklisted? It seemed like you were sending lots and lots of examples to you know, Google or Microsoft or whoever. Was there like a, this one's two hours and 37 minutes or something that made it look like there was a very regular process that was going through and looking at these things? Yeah, so it varied, it definitely varied uh, by entity. Uh, so as I mentioned with Google, we saw some very early activity. Essentially, as soon as the site was reported, they would hit it with a crawler. Uh, and then shortly after that, presumably after verification, it would go ahead and be blacklisted. Uh, but for some of the other entities, there would be indeed a fixed uh, time window uh, before anything would happen. So there's definitely some, some of that going on. Uh, but it's also difficult to measure uh, just because the infrastructure is very diverse. Right. And then you were continually checking GSB or whatever to determine whether you are on the blacklist. Yes. Does that check itself uh, get used as any sort of yeah, input so to? We were very careful to make sure that wouldn't happen. Uh, so when the websites were visited by our infrastructure, uh, we would not display any content, just send a 200 um, status code without any content on it, um, you know, just to make sure that we would not negatively influence this. Cool, thanks.